Uh, I thought what I'd do is talk about corrective taxes. Largely, it's going to be environmental taxes, um, taxes related to health. And a couple of reasons for that. One is that um, while I'm doing some think about this uh, at the moment, think about some of these issues, and so they're in my mind, but also as I think about them, they're kind of a little bit less uh, straightforward maybe than, than, I used to, than I used to think uh, they, they are. So, and I saw too that this wasn't, um, I think, covered elsewhere in, the, in, your, in your work. So I thought maybe let's spend some time thinking about corrective taxes. So what do I mean by corrective tax? So what I mean is just a tax or a subsidy, could be a subsidy, uh, that's motivated not by the usual kind of revenue concerns that we, that we have in mind when we think about taxes, but actually is motivated to try and correct some kind of market failures. So, so we see there's something wrong in the outcome without government intervention. And um, the corrective tax is when we think the best way to address that problem, or at least a way to address the problem, is by some form of taxation. So that's all I mean by uh, a corrective tax. <clears throat> and as I say, I think one reason, <clears throat> maybe if you step back a bit, suppose you were, if you were designing a tax system from scratch, there was no tax system at all, and you were to think, well, how would I want to raise whatever revenue I need? Well, you might think, first of all, you might think of rent taxes, which as we talked a bit about yesterday, rent taxes are non-distorting, so we can raise some money through them without creating excess burden. That sounds a good thing. So they might be you know, high up on your list and probably not far down the list, maybe even second on the list would be corrective taxes of various kinds. So those are taxes, as we say, that <clears throat> basically make the market uh, system work better, but as a side product, produce some revenue. So you might think, well, environmental taxes really should be much higher up the list of tax instruments that governments use than actually uh, they are. So in a way, there's kind of a bit of a puzzle there. Why corrective taxes aren't, uh, and environmental taxes aren't um, more of a mainstay of government uh, of government revenue systems. And, <clears throat> and what happens, I think, in terms of the policy debate is that every so often, when people think about uh, um, a good tax system design, uh, the idea that environmental taxes can be a big part of the answer, uh, the corrective taxes, in particular environmental taxes, can be a big part of the answer, tends to become slightly, you know, rather popular among sort of civil society and elsewhere. Uh, the case gets pushed rather heavily for these these kinds of taxes. So the question is kind of, well, okay, is that really true? Um, how would we, how do, how should we think about the role of corrective taxes? And ultimately, you know, do we think they have a big part to play in uh, tax in the national tax systems, including, I think, not least developing countries, where again, uh, these are often particularly uh, advocated <clears throat> on the grounds that uh, many developing countries have really serious environmental problems. So maybe taxation is a way of addressing those, raising revenue at the same time. So that's the kind of broad context of why I think we it's worth spending time on corrective taxes. And there are going to be two broad forms of corrective tax I'll talk about. The first are addressed to what I'm sure you've, you've come across the idea of externalities, the idea that uh, when one agent, a firm or an individual takes some kind of decision, that may have some effect on people who are not uh, party to the decision. So they're kind of innocent bystanders may get affected by the decisions that uh, a firm or an individual takes, may be affected badly, and that's typically what we'll have in mind, may be affected for, for the good, for the better as well. But nonetheless, the idea is that somebody, you take a, an individual firm, takes an action, decision, and that affects people not party to the decision. So that's what I mean by an externality. I should say a slight footnote, you know, we typically we would set aside um, externalities that operate through the price system. Oh, have, uh, I see the power's gone off. Are you still there? Or am I still there? Um, should I wait? Can you hear me? Yeah. Tell me when you hear me again.
this. Come. Are we back? We are. It's <laughs> yeah, yeah. The South yeah. Africa electricity class. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, do you know? Do you remember where you lost me? You can still see me, right? I can't see myself anymore, but you can still see me, right? What's yes, the slides? The, you are your slides, and okay. we're starting off to explain externalities. Okay. So, externality, it, as many, I'm sure many of you know, um, is something that happens when um, the decision that's taken by some individual or firm has effects on other individuals or firms who weren't party to that decision. So, um, so for example, well, lots of examples, of course, I like being a smoker. I use uh, smoking examples a lot. So I smoke and that irritates other people who weren't in, uh, involved in the decision for me uh, of my decision of whether to light up. So, um, and of course we set aside externalities that may operate through the price system. It could be that, um, you know, if, um, because I decide I want to pay more for some artwork that increases the price paid by somebody else. So in a way it's an externality, but it's what's called a pecuniary externality, a pecuniary externality and doesn't in itself cause any inefficiency. So it's inefficiency. So we're really talking about effects that don't go through the price system. And these things arise in many contexts, externalities rise in many contexts. For example, in the financial sector, um, too big to fail banks can take on uh, more risk than they should. Uh, with the implication that other people are going to bear the cost if they go bust. But I'm going to be focused particularly on, as given one of my earlier remarks, on environmental issues, uh, environmental externalities, which often turn out to be, to be health-related. So most of what I'm going to talk about is really ex dealing with externalities. We'll also talk about the kind of second target, potentially, of corrective taxes, which is what's called in internalities. And those are relate to problems of self-control. So they're not kind of operating between people. The idea is they're operating within a person in terms of their own character, uh, motivations, strengths and weaknesses and so on. So what I'm gonna do is talk about externalities a bit more, talk about the, pro the externality problem, instruments one might use to address externality problems. Then I'll focus on tax-based approaches to deal with uh, externalities, take up some further issues. And then um, I have a bunch of applications we might talk about at the end um, if there's time. So externalities, so I wanted to go through the basic problem of externalities, partly because I think it's actually a little bit more subtle than, than is often um, recognized. It's basically, I think the point, large, large part of the point, a large uh, element of what I want to say is apart from there being several instruments by which you can deal with externalities and taxation is only one, we often think of taxation as being an efficiency issue, but it's also a distributional issue. And I'll come back to that. So there are equity and distributional issues involved in dealing with externalities, which I think often get, um, got left, uh, get left aside. So here's the basic framework. Um, I'm sure you've come across something like this to think about externalities. And I apologize for the quality of my diagrams, which uh, involve more use of an iPhone than I would have liked, but that's how it worked out. So here's the basic structure. We have some on the on the kind of uh, horizontal axis going from left to right is something good. Is clean air, Q, going from left to right. Could be clean water, whatever it is. But the point is that's a good one. Going from left to right is a good thing. Um, and the, essentially there is some benefit derived from clean air uh, in amount big B of Q. That's the social benefit of the clean air in amount Q. But there's some cost of providing clean air. Um, that is to provide clean air, for example, firms may have to incur some abatement costs to reduce the damage that they do to air quality. So C of Q is the level is sorry, C of Q, I shouldn't say marginal there, C of Q itself is just the cost of providing clean air. And then what we have in the picture are the marginals, the marginal benefit B prime. Uh, so essentially as clean air, as the air gets cleaner, uh, benefit goes up, social benefit goes up, but it goes up at a decreasing rate. So the B prime is sloping down. Conversely, to create clean air, uh, the cost of creating clean air essentially goes up at the margin uh, as the initial quality of clean air uh, increases. So the more clean air you have to begin with, the more costly it is to uh, increase, improve air quality. 
So it's helpful. I've set up that diagram in terms of clean air going from left to right. It's helpful, I think, to think of emissions, some kind of pollutant going from uh, right to left, which is uh, essentially damaging uh, air quality. So E is, is some emission of some pollutant that reduces air quality. And so the link between emissions and clean air is given by that equation at the bottom on the left, um, that uh, emissions are equal to big Q, and big Q is like the most clean, the most clean that air could possibly be. Maybe it's 100% or something. So emissions are simply the maximum quality of, 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 of air, less the actual quality, just to make it simple. So it's good to keep in mind uh, in your, both the Q going from left to right and the E emissions going from right to left. So that's the basic structure. And as I'm sure you know, when we think about, well, what's the efficient outcome here? Well, the collectively efficient outcome, the one that maximizes benefits less costs to society as a whole, is going to be where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. And that's at the level of uh, air quality Q star uh, in, the, in the picture. So that's all very straightforward. But just to keep track of what's going on, um, I'm imagining here that we start in a world where the polluter in this story can emit as much as they want. So let's imagine that the, the, the allocation of property rights is that there's no restriction on how much the polluter can emit. So in the absence of any intervention, they're going to emit as much as they want. They're going to drive their costs as low as possible. So we're going to start at that point O in the picture down the left, the origin. That's kind of where we start. Um, so what happens now when we move to the to the uh, collectively efficient point Q star? Well, relative to O, there's an increase in uh, the benefits, which is going to be the area under the marginal benefit curve. So the social benefit goes up by that little triangle by the triangle A plus the triangle on top of it B. That's the total increase in the social benefit. But there's an increase in social costs of this amount alpha, just that red triangle. So the collective gain from doing this is beta. So what have we shown? We've shown moving to the efficient, the collectively efficient outcome, we have a, we have basis, a net social gain of beta. But the point to uh, emphasize, I think, is that this doesn't mean that both sides have gained. It doesn't mean that both the polluter and the pollutee have gained in moving from O to Q star. That is importantly, Q star is Pareto efficient, that is, if we were to start at Q star, there's no way we could change the level of Q and make both parties better off because we're already maximizing the net social benefit. However, it may not be a prey to improvement over where we started off, A, so, uh, point O, sorry. So it's not necessarily a prey to improvement. I haven't told you yet how we get from O to, uh, to Q star. And how we do that is going to matter quite a lot for uh, who gains and who loses from doing this. So it's going back to the point I was making, this was why I think we have to think that um, dealing with externalities is a distributional issue as well as an efficiency issue. Um, and it's going to mean, for example, that when you impose a, a corrective tax, um, there's going to be an issue of, well, okay, clearly the person suffering from the, uh, from, from the externality is going, to, is going to benefit. But what about the person who's being required to uh, emit less? They're presumably worse off. So if we really want to bring about a Pareto improvement, we're going to have to think about compensating the people who are essentially being required to uh, emit less than they otherwise would have done. So that then brings us on. Oh, how did I do that? Oh, hang on. Uh, managed to go right to the end. OK, 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 OK. So now we, have, now we come on to um, the uh, instrument choice issue. That is, how do we deal with an externality? And you know, one way of thinking about this problem is, well, okay, so uh, COVID, we've had COVID. Clearly there was an externality uh, and I just got COVID. So I was stuck in my room for 10 days. So you could ask yourself, well, okay, there would be an externality. If I were to go out on the street, I might make other people sick, but well, okay, why didn't we have a text-based approach? Why wasn't it that I, instead of being stuck in my room for 10 days, I wasn't presented with the option of paying a charge and being free to go wherever I want. So just to, to put in your minds that there is an issue of instrument choice here, and we should really try to articulate, well, why is that? What, what, exact, what exactly was the feature of the COVID problem that meant we thought taxation wasn't the way to go? So 
how do we how do we how are we going to uh, address the externality? So one one approach uh, is known as the Coasian bargaining after Ronald Coase, which basically says, well, let's just leave the two parties to get on with it. Uh, essentially, the polluter would be willing to pay. Uh, the, so the pollutee, the person suffering, would be willing to pay the polluter an amount bigger than alpha, but less than alpha plus beta, to induce them to move to Q star. So basically, if you look at that uh, picture again, we're saying the, uh, the the person who's who's suffering could pay an amount to could pay the polluter could, could pay the polluter an amount bigger than alpha, but yet still leave themselves a net gain from doing so. So the Cosian solution basically one side uh, bribes the other into doing um, uh, into arriving at the efficient solution. Question then is well who gets how does the net gain net gain from doing all this remember it's beta how does that get shared out who gets it well that's going to depend on on the bargaining power. But notice that one feature of the Cosian solution is that both sides have gained because one has um, been happy with the bribe they're paying, the other one's been happy with the bribe they've received. So it's quite a nice solution in that sense. Uh, it really does generate a Pareto improvement relative to O. Uh, of course, practical importance of this solution is often said to be limited because with many externalities, there are going to be just so many people affected, we can't realistically imagine them getting together to negotiate. Well, you might think, well, okay, that's fair, but well, maybe that works in uh, international context. Maybe when you have a bunch of countries negotiating over climate issues, say, maybe then you could think of some kind of cozy and solution. And to some extent, maybe it's surprising that we don't see more kind of side payments, uh, bribes of various kinds being paid, for example, in climate negotiations. We do have climate finance and so on, but you might think that might expect to see more of it. And I think part of the reason we don't is that even with relatively small numbers, you still have this a kind of a free riding problem. That is that the people who the people who um, uh, might be called on to reduce their emissions, their pollution, would prefer that other people reduce their pollution uh, emissions as, uh, instead. So anyway, that's one solution. Cozy and bargaining um, may have may have slightly more applic applicability than is often said. Another is uh, the one that lawyers like and that we don't often talk about as economists. This is basically a liability approach. So this basically says, well, look, if, uh, if, if some damage occurs, then what we do is we require the polluter to actually compensate the pollutee. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't fit very neatly into the framework above because uh, this, is all, this, this liability is in a, really for a world where damage might or might not occur. But basically the idea in the language above is that the polluter uh, is going to basically incur two costs. They're going to incur, incur the costs of abatement, C of Q, but they're also going to re require pay some damage to the pollutee. What's the damage going to be? Well, the damage in the set its framework above is the benefit at big Q. So that's the benefit with perfectly clean air, uh, less the benefit from the actual clear air quality. So that's kind of the damage that the uh, Pollute suffers. And so the polluter is going to minimize the sum of that damage payment and the costs they incur. And if you just look at that equation long enough, you'll see that B of Q is just fixed. That's just whatever the benefit from perfectly clean air is. And then minimizing minus B plus C is the same as maximizing B minus C. So again, you have uh, we this would lead us to the efficient solution uh, that we saw of Q star earlier. What what who are the gainers and losers? Well, the polluter is losing alpha, which is those costs of um, uh, the air, the, the, that, the air in the diagram representing the costs incurred uh, in, of air quality C, plus this damage payment, B of Q. So the polluter loses more than alpha. Um, when is so, again, so the distribution here is quite different from the Cosian solution, for example, even though the outcome is the same. So distribution quite different, outcome in terms of air quality is exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. So when is this approach most likely to be suitable? Well, clearly, arguably, that's going to be most suitable, you know, when damage may not occur, uh, when it's hard to assess a priori what the damage will be. Um, so, for example, this is the sort of thing you might um, be suitable for oil spills or for design for kind of, um, you know, uh, emergencies, uh, catastrophes of some sort like that that occur rarely. It's hard to know how much they will cost. And, but after, afterwards, after the effect, we can assess what the damage was. 
But of course, it also requires a strong judicial system because all this stuff is going through the courts. It's the courts that are determining what the damage is and so on, what the culpability is. So again, so apart from the uh, rare damage, hard to assess in advance, uh, there's a requirement of a strong judicial system. Uh, a third approach, straightforward, is regulation, which in this model simply says, well, we would just dictate that air quality must be at least Q star. Uh, we don't, wouldn't necessarily ban uh, air, uh, any emissions because um, that wouldn't get us to the efficient solution. But we would simply dictate, well, okay, air quality has to be at least Q star. The polluter again loses from this. The uh, polluter incurs the cost alpha. Uh, all the benefit goes to the uh, pollutee. When is that? Is this kind of approach most likely to be suitable? Well, this may make sense when damage is sure to happen. Uh, and maybe when there are relatively few polluters that the regulators can look at, or Q star, the, the optimal quality varies relatively little and is uh, is readily is readily observed. Sorry, did I? Okay, sorry, I thought I heard a question. So we've we've been through already been through three solutions, three approaches before we even come to taxation. And I think that's important in itself. Taxation is not necessarily going to be the top of anyone's list when it comes to deal with externalities. So the Pigovian solution, uh, as I'm sure you know, what we do is we basically decentralize that solution at Q star by setting a tax T star equal to the marginal cost of abatement at that point, C of Q, C prime of Q star. How does, why does that? Well, well the, the producer is now going to minimize T star times the level of emissions. T star is a tax on emissions. Emissions, remember, are big Q minus little Q. And uh, so the producer is going to minimize the, the tax payment plus the costs incurred, C of Q. And that you can see results in setting marginal cost equal to T star, which implies that uh, output is going to be at Q star. So that's basically how it works. Um, point to note again, consistent with my earlier theme, is that the polluter, what happened, who's, who's benefited, who's gained? Well, clearly the pollutee, the one suffering, has gained that whole area beta plus alpha. Um, on the other hand, the uh, polluter has not only lost alpha, that those abatement costs, but now also that whole triangle, that yellow triangle of um, tax payments, T star times Q, big T star times big Q minus little Q star. That's all tax payments. So a couple of things to notice there. Well, when do we think this is going to be most suitable, the tax approach? Well, maybe not too difficult to believe that um, it's going to be most suitable when we think the source of pollution, the pollutant, is just a simple, single, well-defined commodity. Um, you know, if you think about an oil slip, what, what exactly would you, oil slip, what exactly would you, would you tax? Maybe hard to, to, uh, uh, to decide. Uh, so the tax works well, as, as all taxes do, I guess, when the base can be very simple, when the appropriate base is very simple. And also really when you can impose the tax on a relatively few number of firms, again, consistent with standard tax principles, you'd like not to have to tax every little retailer, but to be able to tax a few kind of um, uh, uh, upstream you upstream users and and reach the whole uh, the whole uh, economy that way we might come back to some of those points but there's the other thing to notice about taxation is there's now a new question that didn't arise when we talked about any of those other methods which is what do we do with the revenue um and we have to do something with it if the revenue is wasted if that little triangle just gets completely wasted then uh the whole thing may be a bad idea uh, that area gamma may be bigger than beta, you could draw it that way, in which case, if we throw the revenue away, this whole this whole idea was a bad idea. Um, so that's again, again, this whole distributional issue coming in. And it's worth noting that the Pigovian tax really has two elements. The argument, <coughs> Pigovian tax as a, um, as a route to, or excuse me, <coughs> if you talk about a Pigovian tax, and you simply point out that the Pigovian tax gets us to the right level of the externality, but that's only part of the story, because if that's all you've done and you haven't done anything with the revenue, you may have made things worse off. So the question, what you do with the revenue, do you compensate, do you try to compensate the, uh, the polluter? Uh, is there actually enough money? Is, is, is gamma large enough to compensate the polluter? All these questions, I think, are often overlooked when we simply talk about Pigovian taxes. We say, oh, yes, 
set T star, we get Q star, end of story. That really shouldn't be the end of the story. And I think that matters in important ways for policy, uh, as we'll see uh, later. Uh, excuse me, I think I better have something to drink. So just a note, oh, excuse me one moment. So just a note, the, um, there, that's the tax base, that's the Pagodian tax. Very similar results come about if you use what's called cap and trade or emissions trading. So basically the story here is instead of setting a tax, what we do is we uh, create permits to emit in an amount big Q minus uh, Q star. And then we essentially auction these permits so that people, so that firms can essentially bid against each other to acquire the permits, allowing them to emit. <clears throat> Not too difficult to believe that that C prime curve really becomes a demand for permits in that sense. And the market for those Q star uh, the, the right to emit big Q minus Q star uh, 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 pollutants will clear at a price of T star. So essentially uh, the cap and trade in this simple framework is going to be the same as a tax-based approach. You're going to end up with the same, uh, uh, can end up with the same air quality and also the same revenue, but now the revenue is the form of, is in the form of sales from, um, of licenses to emit. And then um, there are some differences in practice. Um, rights are often allocated for free, um, which rather dissipates the revenue effect. Uh, it's actually more, slightly more common that the proceeds of uh, emissions trading are earmarked slightly more to particular purposes than the tax revenues from uh, corrective taxes, but we'll come back to that later. It's, but I'm not though gonna say much more about um, cap and trade because to the kind of, um, to the first order, it's much the same as the tax-based solutions that I'll, that I'll be focusing on. Well, so let me let's focus a little bit on what are, what are often uh, the, the two leading contenders uh, for dealing with externalities, uh, taxes and regulation. How do, we, how do we compare them? When is taxation going to be important, uh, appropriate, and when is regulation going to be appropriate? So we're basically focusing on what are the differences between the, the two. Um, which again, you can have at the back of your mind, why was regulation rather than taxation better uh, to deal with, with COVID? Well, one issue is compensation is a more fundamental issue with taxation, because remember taxation imposes that additional rectangle of loss on the polluter. So the question of, well, uh, you're making the uh, polluter much worse off with taxation than regulation. What are you gonna do about that? Do you think it's appropriate instead to, uh, to try to compensate? Um, the polluter. Um, <clears throat> there are also differences that arise in the second bullet when you have many polluters uh, and, and the damage depends on total emissions. So for example, you know, one might have in mind uh, climate, for example, climate change, where the uh, impact on global emissions simply depends on the total of emissions over all sources of emissions or firms. So suppose in this picture differs only from the previous one only in that I've added, imagine that there are two firms now, C1 and C2, and they have, they have different marginal cost structures. And C prime is now the horizontal uh, addition of those two cost curves. And C prime, I think you'll easily convince yourself, gives you the um, essentially the cost of a total amount of emissions uh, when those emissions are allocated efficiently between the two emission sources. But anyway, suppose we have, we, we look at this world, and again, the optimum is we want total emissions of Q star. How can we achieve that? Well, one way is we can go around all these firms. We can go to firm two and say, okay, your optimal emissions are Q star two. And then we go to firm, your, your, your optimal emissions are kind of the opposite of that rather, re reading from big Q. Uh, so we could say to, to firm uh, two, uh, your optimal emissions are big Q minus Q star two. Then we go to firm one, we look at their cost curve and we say, oh, no, you're, uh, you have rather heavy costs. Uh, so your emissions uh, are going to be, we allow you somewhat heavier emissions of big Q minus Q star one. So you'd have to go around these firms, figure out individually what their optimal emissions are. But on the other hand, if you figure out, if you look at this picture and you instead simply set uh, a price of T star at the same level where C prime intersects B prime, you can see that those two firms will automatically, by equating their marginal costs to the tax, they'll automatically choose the efficient levels Q star one, Q star two. 
So the tax achieves the minimum, uh, it achieves the uh, essential goal of output of the, <clears throat> sorry, achieves the goal of overall uh, emissions reduction in the most efficient way. It does it automatically through the price system. But regulation, of course, doesn't. You have to have much more information to make the regulatory approach work. And that, I think, just to anticipate a bit, is one reason why most economists think that carbon taxation is going to be a better way to, to mitigate, to, to reduce emissions than regulatory measures, because essentially that this is a climate change fits this kind of situation very directly. Many different emitters with different cost structures. Let's have a single price and allow that to automatically determine who should mitigate most and who should mitigate uh, least. One other, oops, why do I keep doing that? Uh, so one other difference between taxes and, and regulation that I think is, is gets a lot of attention and I think is quite interesting is, well, the model I had above, uh, everything was perfectly certain. Suppose, though, that we don't really know what uh, the cost structures, the, the, and I'm going back now to world with basically just one firm, as it were, we don't know what cost structures will turn out to be. Uh, so there's some uncertainty. Suppose there's uncertainty. Well, what do we? How can we compare price and and or well, tax and regulatory measures then? Well, this is a, a kind of very nice analysis, classic analysis due to uh, Weizmann back a long time ago, but still I think a classic. So okay, so look at the, we look at this picture again. So uh, suppose we know that the benefits, the marginal benefit curve is B prime. Actually, if we doesn't really matter, as we'll see, if we're uncertain about P prime, but let's let's assume for simplicity, we're not. We know the marginal benefit, the marginal social benefits there. We we think on average the uh, marginal cost is going to be given by that unbroken C prime line, but there's some chance cost will turn up, marginal cost will turn out to be either lower C L prime or higher C H prime, and we think, well, okay, in this world, should we go for taxation or should we go for regulation? Well, uh, let's think first about uh, regulation. And let's imagine that uh, the costs have turned out to be low. So we're, we're working in that CL prime world. So then the, the real optimum is at L, is at that point L, where the <clears throat> B prime intercepts, intersects CL1. However, with regulation, we, we're stuck. We've got, uh, we've fixed the quantity at Q star. And Q star is clearly too low. Because if we look at when we're at Q star, you can see that, well, given B prime and given C L prime, the uh, marginal benefit exceeds marginal cost. So we should be emitting more. And the dead weight loss from uh, our output being stuck at uh, Q star is that red area. So that's the red area between the B prime and the C L prime. That's the kind of inefficiency we've got from using, um, uh, from using regulatory measures. But well, suppose instead that we had used uh, taxation and we'd set the tax T, T star according to where we uh, think correctly that C prime and B prime intersect. But now again, suppose that in fact, what's happened is that the costs have turned out to be, to be very low. Well, what's gonna happen is that the, uh, I should have marked this on the diagram, but at the tax of T star prime, the level of air quality is going to be where that red, where that kind of vertical red line intersects the CL prime line. That's where the uh, the firm is going to choose to abate. Um, and you can see that so relative to that point, well, at that point, um, the marginal cost of, um, uh, of, of abatement, the CL prime exceeds B prime. So we're actually, we've actually uh, abated rather, uh, rather too little or we, the air quality is kind of rather too high and so now the dead weight loss we look to compare the that we essentially look at the area above <coughs> the, B, the b prime curve but below the cl prime curve and that's that yellow shaded area so what this is saying is the the dead weight loss from choosing regulation if things turn out if cost abatement costs turn out to be lower than expected at cl prime dead weight loss using regulation is that kind of red area but the dead weight loss from using taxation is that big yellow area. So in this context, regulation is clearly better. And you can do a similar exercise with the CH prime curve if costs turn out to be higher than, than expected. And you get a similar conclusion. You get a big yellow area and you get a small 
small uh, red area. So what is that saying? That's saying in this situation, regulation is better than taxation. Why is that? Well, if you just look at the diagram, what have I fixed up to make the diagram look like that? Well, what I've done is make the benefit curve very steep relative to the, to the marginal cost curve. And that turns out to be the kind of critical thing that regulations preferred whenever the marginal benefit is steeper uh, than marginal, marginal cost. And essentially the intuition is there because getting the tax wrong has a big quantity effect when the cost curve is very flat um, and that has a that has a big that has a big damage impact. The lesson from that, I think, is that regulation is likely to matter more when it's an externality that has a real kind of tipping point uh, property. That is, if there is some level of uh, the in this example air quality, but more generally whatever environmental index you have in mind, if there is some quantity such as really really costly to go beyond that. Uh, then that suggests that regulation is going to be the way to go. And that's something that uh, I think people have drawn, discussed a lot in the context of climate change, given that in the climate context, we know there are these real tipping point problems uh, when the kind of West Star tank shield begins to, to melt and methane gets released from permafrost frost and all that sort of stuff. So there's, there's a, there are potentially significant lessons there for, for climate uh, issues that we may that we may come back to. So I'm not going to go through this. Uh, this is just a kind of a little bit of a heat map, trying to identify which of the various instruments we've talked about is uh, is most suitable in different circumstances. But as, as I say, I won't go through this. But the two points to bear in mind, I think, are just this one: that well, yes, um, taxation isn't the only response to externalities. It often will not be the best response, um, and in many contexts, something I haven't really talked about. Uh, you may want to combine appropriate in instruments. You may want an element of regulation and an element of, of taxation. And we'll see some examples of that later on. So again, the, the other takeaway from all this is just this whole point that um, there are all these distributional effects that we might want to, to worry about or think about at least when we ponder alternative ways of addressing environmental problems or corrected taxation more generally. So, Maybe just to touch on a couple of further issues on, so now I'm putting aside that this whole range of instrument choice, focusing particularly on taxation. What are some of the issues we come across then? Well, there's a lot of talk, as you probably know in the literature, about um, the idea of there being a double dividend from environmental taxes in the, in the sense that, well, you may, maybe, with the, maybe with environmental taxes, we can actually reduce excess burden, make the tax system more efficient, uh, and address environmental issues at the same time. I think that literature has been extraordinarily uninformative. Uh, it's very difficult to, to see how that can happen unless the initial tax system isn't uh, in some sense optimal to begin with. And if it's not optimal to begin with, then why weren't you reforming it to start to, to, uh, from, from the outset? So I kind of mentioned double dividend rather dutifully. I don't think the literature on that has been terribly uh, instructive. What has been, I think, an instructive insight is to say, well, okay, suppose that um, uh, you know, we want revenue, so let's now introduce a revenue motive. Um, and so suppose we just have a single kind of indirect tax, we're in a kind of a Ramsey rule world where we're just setting one tax on some commodity. But now suppose that commodity uh, generates some adverse externality. What, is the, what does the tax rule look like in that case? Well, so now our problem is going to be to maximize, and I'll just try and briefly explain the notation. V of P plus T is the kind of the uh, indirect utility that is gives how well off the consumer is, uh, given that they face a price of uh, P plus uh, P the producer price, T the tax. Um, on the other hand, so that is uh, that the V is indicating how well off they are. We know against this, however, we, we weigh uh, some damage at a rate of D that is associated with consumption X of this good. And the consumption X of this good depends on the consumer price plus the tax. And so the first two terms really are consumer welfare, given there's some damaging uh, consequence of the uh, consumption of uh, the tax good. And then the final term is to indicate that we care about revenue. So revenue is big T times X, the tax times quantity consumed. And lambda is then just the weight, the social weight we attach to, to raising revenue. <clears throat> so lambda has got to be bigger than one, otherwise we wouldn't bother to raise revenue at all. 
So if you then grind through that exercise and um, maximize uh, that with respect to T, you do the, the optimal tax exercise now with the externality, what do you get? You get the result in that T over P equation there. And if you with so on the right hand side, we have two terms. The first term, the lambda minus one over lambda times one over E, E being the elasticity of demand. That's really just the standard Ramsey rule in this context. So you have the Ramsey, so the orbital tax has this Ramsey component. And then the second term is relates to D, which is the damage. So that's where the externality comes in. So you're charging something higher than the Ramsey tax to reflect the damage that consumption of this, of this good does. Um, couple of points to note there. This is a kind of a simplified form of the kind of um, an added, what's called an additivity principle uh, associated with SAMO, that when you have environmental damage of this sort, you basically end up with an additional kind of additive term in your various optimal tax expressions. But the other point to note is that um, Remember I said that lambda has to be bigger than one for this problem to make sense. Well, if lambda is bigger than one, then that final term is less than D. So what does that mean? That means that the add-on, the kind of the add-on tax to the, um, to the Ramsey component is less than the kind of first best Pigovian rate. That is, uh, you, you, you don't simply take the Ramsey tax and then add the Pigovian tax calculated as equal to marginal social damage. You add less than that. Um, essentially because it's so that the, the, the creative component is smaller than the first best Bigovian term. And that's intuitively because one of the effects of the tax is going to be essentially to amplify uh, initial distortions. Typically, if the initial system is optimal, you can only through by adding another tax, increase excess burden. And because you're increasing excess burden, that makes environmental taxation uh, less attractive than the first best calculation I would suggest. So that's, I think, an important lesson. There are some qualifications to it that, we're, that I think are quite important in practice, but it's again worth bearing in mind that actually, you know, the, when, when we're thinking about, um, you know, when you're, when you're concerned about revenue, that doesn't kind of amplify the environmental tax add-on. It actually, if anything, reduces it if the initial tax system is, is, set, to, is set well to begin with. So this, I think, is, a, is an important slide. So let me spend a little bit of time on it. What to do with the money? Um, you have you've imposed your you know your perfectly calibrated Bigovian tax. Let's go back to the first best world. You've imposed that tax. You've raised some money. What are you going to do with it? And we know that um, you know if you throw it away, um, that may mean that the whole process has been has actually reduced social welfare. So what are you going to do with it? Well, one thing of course you can do is simply add it to general revenues and in the sense um, you know uh, finance additional spending through that route. And that's the route I think many people hope, for example, that environmental taxes are going to have untapped potential to meet strong revenue needs in developing countries and elsewhere, particularly with the SDGs in mind. And I guess something like that may be what many, uh, many kind of uh, public finance people would, would argue for. Well, they'd say, well, look, it's a tax like anything else. Uh, let's use it to, to, uh, to um, if spending is a priority, let's use it to increase spending. Uh, an alternative use that some people advocate is, well, why don't we reduce other distorting taxes? Why don't we, for example, and this is something often heard, is to say, well, look, we know the corporate tax is very distorting, so why don't we reduce the, why don't we use the money to reduce the corporate tax? You could think of other taxes as well that one might reduce. Uh, alternatively, we could, we could actually try to compensate the losers we could recognize that in this process, we have made some firms, some individuals better off, uh, should we compensate them? So again, for example, if you think about climate issues where we might be raising uh, gas prices and energy prices more generally, uh, should we be actually compensating uh, the people who are now facing higher energy prices? Um, in some sense, uh, you know, in some deeper sense, they are the polluters, but nonetheless, we may think it appropriate to, to compensate them. Uh, are there actually adequate tools in practice to do that? Uh, so, for example, we might think of some developing countries, we might think about using biometric identifiers to pay poll subsidies to compensate people. But there's a whole kind of question of do we use the money to compensate the losers, which in a way I think would be consistent with the spirit of the initial Pigovian uh, rationale for these taxes. 
Or do we earmark? That is, do we allocate this spending or this revenue that we get from environmental taxes? Do we allocate that to particular purposes, maybe to environment related spending? Um, now, it has to be said, most public finance people don't like earmarking taxes, particular spending in that way, because it kind of makes, uh, you know, it's either meaningless if the earmarking doesn't really constrain how much you spend on, on a particular item, or if it does constrain uh, what you spend, well, you might not uh, want to be constrained in that way when some other spending needs turn up. So people tend not to like uh, earmarking in, in public finance terms. Maybe it can be used, on the other hand, maybe earmarking can be used as some kind of compensation, either to firms or to, uh, to individuals, something, remember, Yuka's written about. Um, and maybe by earmarking, you know, maybe it's a way of overcoming people's natural suspicion when governments introduce new taxes that somehow the money is going to be wasted. Um, so there's a kind of a, a full menu for, the, for, you, for you there of things that uh, you might want to do with the revenue from environmental taxes. And I think that the point I'm making is that this, this issue here is not just a kind of um, a minor add-on when you think about environmental taxes. It's, I think, a large part of the issue. Let me then, in a few minutes left, say a little bit about some of the uh, applications. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll try and speed up a little bit near the end. Applications of this idea. Well, of course, the, the main application, the leading application these days, is in thinking about dealing with climate change, which uh, you know Nick Stern calls the mother of all externalities. Um, we know there is a big externality from the emission of global uh, greenhouse gases. Um, of course, there's uh, a problem, a free rider problem, in dealing with this global problem from greenhouse gases that everybody would rather that somebody else did, uh, did the reduction of emissions. The point I wanted to make when we think about climate change is that, well, if you're, say, a small developing country, you may well think, look, you know, what, I, what I do, and you'd be right to think, what I do makes little difference to climate change. I'm, I'm a small country. I didn't cause the problem anyway. Uh, so really, why should I do anything? Those are all kind of perfectly uh, reasonable concerns. However, it turns out that um, burning fossil fuels in particular has causes significant local externalities in the form, particularly of air pollution. Uh, that is, there are substantial local co-benefits from reducing the burning of, of fossil fuels. Um, that is, bur reducing uh, burning of fossil fuels is not simply good for the global environment. In many countries, it's good for the local environment too. And I think that's possibly the more persuasive case for many such countries as to why they ought to be taxing fossil fuels more heavily than they are. The chart on the right simply illustrates that. It basically illustrates that even if you take account just of the of the domestic environmental benefits, nothing to do with uh, climate change, even leaving aside climate change, you get very large, potentially very large domestic benefits from effective carbon taxation. You can see in some in China, we're talking about over 3% of GDP. In other countries, we're, we're certainly in the sort of significant parts of significant fractions of 1% uh, of, of, of GDP. So that's a key lesson. Substantial co-benefits um, make a difference to the case for fossil fuel uh, mitigation. Um, there's a whole set of issues to talk about as between tax and cap and trade. Uh, we might want to think, for example, well, maybe cap and trade is better for climate because of those tipping points. That is, we can kind of fix with, with cap and trade, you're fixing the total quantity of emissions. Maybe that's a, a good a plus uh, given these kind of tipping points, given what we were saying earlier on uh, about, um, about uh, the importance of those. Well, that's not completely persuasive because some of these things happen quite slowly and you can adjust tax, age, tax rates over time. Tax can be less prone to uh, exemptions. Uh, so the case for carbon taxes in particular, I think, still remains strong. Uh, people always worry, of course, about the distributional impact of carbon taxes, carbon prices to deal with um, uh, yeah. burning of fossil fuels. Uh, it turns out actually, um, maybe not surprisingly, that the distributional impact of uh, taxing, uh, carb taxing carbon is not necessarily regressive in many low income countries. You can see that on the, uh, the, on the picture on the left basically shows the, uh, in, is indicating the distributional impact of, of carbon taxation. And you can see that in 
the US and China is pretty uh, pretty regressive because of a large proportional burdens borne by the lowest core, the core quintile. But that's not true in India. In fact, the opposite is true. And that may be true more generally in low income countries where people are off the grid. Uh, so to some extent, they're protected from uh, the increases in, in uh, fossil fuel prices. So <clears throat> that's uh, all I wanted to say about climate change, except that uh, well, what I've been focusing on has been um, uh, basically related to fossil fuels, CO2, but that's uh, of fossil fuels, but that's not the only source of greenhouse gases. Many others are no less important in many low income countries land use change, agriculture, and there's a whole set of unresolved issues, I think, as to what scope there is for uh, tax measures in those sectors, as opposed to regulatory sectors. And that's where I think thinking through some of the issues we were talking about before on instrument choice can be important. Um, so let me maybe just, um, uh, I'd like to get to the end of this slide um, because it introduces the, uh, uh, well, I'm going to introduce the internality idea. So tobacco taxation, close to my heart. Uh, tobacco tax, we know that smoking has many adverse externalities. Passive smoking, health risks, unpleasantness, uh, undeniable, uh, all kinds of externalities that are bad. On the other hand, uh, there are some positive fiscal externalities. For example, uh, if smokers die early, then that lowers the pension payments for them, and that increases... Um, the pool available for everybody else's pensions. So there's a beneficial effect of smoking in fiscal terms. And in some, some writers claim that actually some of these positive benefits actually outweigh, um, outweigh the, uh, um, uh, the adverse ones. Again, you know, smokers, you know, we have, smokers have, um, I, won't go, I won't go into the gory details, but you can see where I'm, where I'm going. But in any case, some of that is controversial, but I think what is not so controversial is that it's hard to explain why cigarette taxes are so high in many countries, purely on the basis of externality arguments. In a way, it doesn't, it tends really not to add up. Uh, so why are cigarette taxes uh, so high? And let me make an aside here. Uh, remember that this is supposed to be a corrective tax. And we talked to, earlier about corrective taxes and maybe you want to compensate the losers. And it's not completely joking, but how come no one feels a need to compensate smokers uh, for, for, the, for the tax they suffer? Um, and I think that's maybe where this idea of sin comes into it. I don't like talking about sin taxes, but there's some notion that it's inherently, inherently a bad thing. Uh, otherwise, I think, you know, I don't know why in some intellectual sense, compensation arguments don't come into it rather, rather more. Um, but so the answer to the question, why are cigarette taxes uh, as high as they are, seems to be, uh, the rationale now uh, given most commonly is this uh, problem of internalities. What is an internality as opposed to an externality? It's basically the idea of a time consistency problem. That is that uh, when you're young, you might want to say, well, I'd like to smoke for a few years, uh, but then I want to quit. I'll, I would like to quit in a few years. Um, the trouble is when that time comes to quit, when you're a few years older, it's become too hard to stop. So you, it's a time consistency problem in the sense that it's very difficult to go through in the future with what seem to you to be the optimal decisions today. And so the rationale then for, uh, for the high tax is to kind of essentially deter people from starting uh, and hence uh, to address nothing to do with externalities or passive smoke or anything, but to help people kind of overcome this time consistency problem uh, by um, not smoking in the first place. And that argument can be used to rationalize much higher uh, taxes. Uh, people are already saying that called for a tax of about $10 a pack in the US uh, 20 years ago. And there's certainly taxes kind of above that now in a, number of, uh, in a number of US states. Some people argue that this is actually even progressive because we know that uh, low income groups tend to smoke more, at least in the, in the sort of advanced economies. Uh, so some say this is actually a progressive measure. Others, and I'll leave it to you, others might say it's actually really just paternalism uh, by, another, by another label. So I think, let me just take for a couple, two more minutes. You okay? Yep, I just sure. want to say something, yeah. I just want to make a couple of other points. Let me say something about, ex, about alcohol, because it, this is the, kind of the other, you know, I'm focusing on these because these are sort of the well-established taxes that partly have a, a sometimes given a corrective motivation. <laughs> 
alcohol in particular, we know the externalities are huge from, from uh, abusive ex, uh, alcohol consumption, road accidents, domestic violence, crime, health, all kinds of things, self-damage, uh, all kinds of internality concerns as well. So the question then becomes, well, why aren't taxes higher on, on alcohol? Given all these horrendous uh, side effects of abusive alcohol consumption, well, one reason I think is that damage from alcohol, it doesn't just depend on how much you drink over your lifetime. It's not very linear. Smoking damage is in some sense kind of linear over your lifetime. So damage really arises from, or some, some of the most damaging forms of, uh, of, of uh, adverse effects, ex ex adverse externalities arise, as you know, probably when you drink a lot in a very short period. So it can be hard to essentially implement a tax that is depends, a tax on the next uh, drink that depends on uh, how recently you had your last drink and what was it. So it's harder to reach, it's harder to kind of control the most damaging <clears throat> consumption through taxation for alcohol than it is through um, uh, for, for tobacco. Um, another reason may be that if you have, when you have heavy taxes on alcohol, and I don't know if this may be more topical than I thought it was gonna be, you have heavy taxes on alcohol, uh, that leads to uh, bootlegs, that leads, leads to illicit production. And same is true of cigarettes, but it, illicit cigarettes don't kill you any more quickly, as far as I know, than regular cigarettes. However, bootleg alcohol can, I think, as we know, can be really deadly. So there is a real issue with alcohol of, uh, of um, encouraging bootleg consumption. So let me, uh, I'm just going to briefly give you a flavor of some of the current issues uh, that would fit under this heading. I'm not going to go through them. We can talk about them uh, if you like and if there's time. I talked about cigarettes. Well, the big issue now with cigarettes is what to do about electronic cigarettes. Um, in a way, it's difficult for governments because we know they're less damaging. Uh, so you might say, well, shouldn't they have a lower tax? Well, um, it's not clear yet how policymakers react to that. I think they're certainly uh, they're worried about revenue uh, if people if they put a low tax on e-cigarettes. Uh, so the addiction, to some extent, may be more on the part of governments than on the part of smokers. Um, but I think that's an area where policy is not yet sorted out. Uh, marijuana in a number of countries is now becoming a kind of a serious revenue raiser. A lot of issues around soft drinks, um, question of whether we should have heavy taxes on soft drinks uh, as part as way to deal with obesity issues. Um, actually, maybe less of an issue in many developing countries, in part because they already have quite often taxes on soft drinks, more as a kind of um, revenue raising item than as anything else. <clears throat> I haven't talked about um, research and development, um, which I just mentioned here, because that's an example where there may be beneficial externalities. So the correction becomes a uh, uh, extent to which you want to subsidize basic research that may spill over into other areas. There are issues now about beef and dairy. Uh, we know that uh, beef, uh, and dairy uh, account for a huge proportion of greenhouse gases, 6% uh, of all greenhouse gases from, from uh, beef. And you know that does make the question of uh, tax responses uh, in that area a kind of a real one. Many countries talk about taxes on fatty foods. It's not clear why we should do that when in many countries, many advanced countries, we don't tax food properly at all. Maybe we should just tax food, say in the UK. And so this whole issue becomes, well, there's all kinds of areas now where you could think of externality and internality arguments for corrective taxes. But the uh, question becomes, where do you actually draw, draw a line if you need to in the kind of tax differentiation this would imply? So uh, sorry that's been a bit of a rush, um, but I, I hope I've given a sense of this is, I think, a more a richer area, I think, than I perhaps thought it was a, a few years ago. So back to you, you'll get to see if there's any uh, questions and sorry i've run you right into time sorry no no need to be sorry that was excellent that was an excellent overview thank you so much any people yes please <clears throat> yeah so on the question of why uh <laughs> Cigarette taxes are so high. I was thinking about alcohol. In some countries, they can 
test you for like you know how intoxicated you are and then they will give you you know like a ticket or something but when it comes to tobacco or cigarettes there's no way of doing yes. that so that could probably explain why they didn't just tax it because if, if alcohol you can get penalty uh if they test you and they find that you are about that uh, so maybe that could explain the significant behind that so for tobacco Yes, I yeah, I I I didn't I didn't get all of that, but I think I think you're um getting to the point about how again coming back to the instrument choice thing, right? That it's uh, that in many cases, and I should have maybe elaborated, you want to have both taxes and uh regulatory measures uh to address a problem. So like smokers, as well as the um you know the heavy taxation, there are restrictions on where you can smoke you know you have to go outside pubs to smoke uh which is kind of regulatory measures supporting the uh supporting the um uh the tax measures and as you say the the easiest way to you know the, 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 for the uh for the for the driving or for the for the drinking uh you know maybe direct ways in which you can directly monitor and and um charge people how much they've drunk are the kind of ways things you've been thinking about maybe yeah obviously has a has a productive role but i hope i hope i got you i understood you right but i think you're dead right that um it's the mix of tax and regulation that matters and the appropriate mix is going to be different in different um different contexts please um yeah thank you for the presentation that was quite helpful i think particularly in the arguments between using a tax or regulation measures i think my question is more related to the argument that we need to compensate the polluters or the smokers i don't think i caught that argument um could you maybe just elaborate a bit more because in my understanding the benefit that was already there perhaps existed because of the inefficiency in the market right so then if we're trying to correct the market why would you still compensate um the polluters yeah so maybe you could just explain that a bit more yes okay um I just wonder if it helps to go back to the to the picture. <coughs> so it's really uh, which way is it? This one. Um, I think there's a distinction when you think about policy. You're starting from some position. Uh, do you want to arrive at an outcome that's Pareto efficient? <clears throat> That you want to arrive somewhere from where you can't make anybody better off without making anybody worse off and or do you care about what happens on the way to that point that is do you do you want to have a Pareto improvement in uh moving to uh the Pareto efficient point so the kind of the so <clears throat> maybe maybe in some cases you don't but i think in general we might say that we might say if we can bring about a Pareto improvement that would be something we would like rather than to have one person benefit and another person lose uh you know even if the benefit the person who benefits benefits more than the person who loses we might in general think it would be fairer if we could arrange things so that uh, everybody gains and the point in the externality context is that yes you could you could by eliminating the externality you could if you wanted to make both people better off you know in this example you know you can uh in this example you can clearly the the uh, the person who's suffering benefits they benefit by this whole area beta plus alpha um the uh the the, the uh polluty is certainly going to lose the amount alpha um but you could share some of that surplus um with the polluter and make them both better off just just because total benefits gone up so you could total net benefits gone up so you could make them both better off so i think step one in the argument the bit i'm trying to put in your mind i think is that well in eliminating the externality you could in principle um make everybody better off so why wouldn't you why wouldn't why do you ever not want to do that and one argument might be um it has to be some kind of moralistic argument um could be that well you 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 take the view that that allocation of property rights is in some sense wrong 
that it was not it was not appropriate that I could smoke as much as I wanted or that this firm could emit as much as it wanted. You could say, well, that was the allocation of property rights, but I don't think it's the right one. I don't think it's fair, so I'm not going to compensate uh, the person who I'm going to be making worse off. OK, so that would be one uh, argument. And OK, I'm happy if that's the argument people want to make. I guess I would just sort of like it to be I'm arguing that's an argument one would try to make. Um, but then there are other contexts, I think, where, I've, where if I say you should compensate the losers, you would say, well, yes, of course we should. And again, go back to the climate issue. So climate, I imagine we're going to raise energy prices. And imagine, a little bit contrary to that later slide, imagine when we raise energy prices, well, it, actually not perfectly consistent with that slide. When we raise energy prices, the poor are going to be worse off. Some of the poor are going to be worse off. Even if the thing's progressive, they're still going to be worse off. So we're raising energy prices to deal with this externality. And some of the poorer are uh, being made worse off. Well, I guess we'd probably say it's perfectly reasonable to compensate them. Uh, we'd probably want to do that. Um, but it's equally true that in the, I had a slight throwaway remark, they are the polluters. They were doing, they were doing, they were responsible for the pollution in the first place. So I guess what I'm saying is there's, there's, a, there's a set of issues there that maybe it's good to, um, elaborate a bit more yeah. than we usually than we usually do so I, I hope that makes some hope that makes some some sense okay so uh, we are a little bit over time but there are still two questions it's okay to take them yeah please Rebecca, and then send and, and then we're done right. uh, uh, when he was speaking on the train effect of, uh, for example, fossil fuel energy uh, factor, um, he had said that um, the study showed that uh, he didn't have uh, that much impact in uh, low income countries, right? Um, and then one of the examples is the fact that most of the people are outside of the grid already, so that may have impacted. But then um, looking at some countries of what we've seen, uh, more than any increase because of already existing efficiencies. In energy price, it, it affects the food prices across and everything in the market. Uh, wouldn't that have an impact? And just like you said in responding to this question, that the uh, the poor was off in that situation, but in some cases everyone is worse off. Um, but those with more uh, resources are able to get through that. So maybe to balance how the study came about, and it doesn't have any impact. Um, the should not uh, impact is low when. We can, I mean, in our experience, we see how things change on the movements in energy prices. Did you get that, Mick? No, I had trouble with that one. I know it was energy prices, but I got, I <laughs> didn't really get that one. It was long. So. Yeah, can you speak up and maybe give you right. a the, the, the question is um, when you were talking about the distribution impacts, uh, you used the example of fossil fuel. Uh, he said it was observed that it was low uh, in low-income countries, that impact wasn't that much. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm seeing from normal experience, whenever um, there is any movement upwards in energy price, um, that also affects prices across the market because of existing efficiency. Uh, the example you gave was being outside of the grid for um, foreign communities, um, but there is also impact outside of being outside of the grid because the, the producers also sometimes provide electricity for themselves. So any increase in fast prices across the whole market. But in responding to her question, you had mentioned also uh, that the poor people might be worse off in such a situation. So the question is how maybe the study finds that the trend path is low, but uh, from some sort of um, experience, we see how prices move once they move in energy. Can the point in Nigeria where I'm from? Maybe that might help. Okay. I think, th thanks very much. I think I got um, maybe 80%. So it's on this distributional <laughs> impact. Um, I think, okay, I wouldn't say that the impact on the poor, I wasn't claiming the impact on the poor is small. I was claiming that um, in the India case, for example, as a proportion of, I think in this case, consumption, it's smaller than it is for the best off. So I was saying the tax in that case seems to be progressive. It still can be the case that um, there is a large that the impact on the poor in kind of absolute terms 
could still be could still be large. Um, so I wouldn't say the I wouldn't say the studies show the impact is small. Um, I think they I say that, uh, that, that they suggest and it hasn't been done for all that many countries. So I shouldn't be too confident in my generalization. But um, the, the claim is that it's uh, not necessarily regressive. Uh, but it may nonetheless be a significant amount for uh, for the for the poor, which is why I was saying that you know if you do these kind of things, you would I think want to think about measures to compensate the very poorest. I think you're asking too about um, kind of the the way in which energy prices get embodied in in the whole range of prices. I think that was if I understood correctly, and that's perfectly true. Of course, there's kind of the indirect effect. Um, and in principle, I believe these studies try to take account of that, as, as, as I understand, as to the best of my belief, these studies do try to take account of the indirect, you know, they work through the kind of the input output to figure out what the, what the price impact is. So um, people have tried to take account of that. And I think, um, so that's, that's, that's the only claim I would make that in, in, a, in a few cases where this has been looked at, it seems to be progress, the impact seems to be maybe, maybe not regressive, but that may mean that there's still a kind of a large absolute impact. Um, and that I think does reflect uh, the, the, the indirect effects that I think you were mentioning as well as the direct ones. Thanks, so final question, sir. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Now on the use of, um, on the issue of what to do with um, the creative taxes revenue, your fourth point, um, on the year mark, you said uh, most public finance experts uh, do not want this option. But I'm looking at it from a developing country perspective where we already have issues of mismanagement of uh, revenue that are raised through taxes. And also, given the background that we have a lot of uh, environmental issues back home in our country, uh, would you advise um, the setting up of special uh, environmental funds, uh, like say a green fund account, so that in the case where a country introduces these taxes, a certain amount of those monies will be put into those funds so that we can monitor expenditures that government uh, might take with respect to correcting some of these issues. Other than just opening it up and put it into the general government funds. I'm glad you asked because back in 1996, when I was in Essex studying, uh, studying under Mick, we, we discussed the marking a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, so maybe you can answer that one, Yoko, because I'm, I'm a bit torn on <laughs> no. I'm a, I'm, I'm a bit torn on, I'm, I'm a little bit torn on these issues, I must say. Um, I think my bottom line is that I don't really like earmarking because I think it, um, you know, you risk end up having lots of nuisance taxes. And, you know, there are countries that once you have earmarking for the environment, then soon you're going to be having earmarking for health. You're going to have earmarking for education, um, earmarking for whatever, for the hosting the next World Cup or whatever it is. And <laughs> I, think, I think that does, you know, earmarking either, if it really constrains your spending, then it's kind of not a particularly good thing because why, sh why should your spending on environmental cleanup be related to whatever your environmental tax is? I and mean, there's no necessary link between the two. So you don't want to have a very firm link. Um, on the other hand, if there's not a very firm link, then what are you saying when you earmark? You're kind of just being non-transparent. But, um, but I think there is a sense in which, you know, sometimes, you know, if you're willing to play not very nice political games. I think probably there are cases where earmarking has helped to persuade people to accept taxes that maybe in other cases they wouldn't have. Um, there is, I should say, um, I, I'm gonna take a minute whether Yuka likes it or not. So I've, I have a recent book with Joel <laughs> Slemrod on, on taxation and uh, basically, you know, trying to make taxation interesting by telling stories from history and so on. The best quote about earmarking is from Winston Churchill when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer in about 1926. But I'm not going to tell you what the quote is because then you have to buy the book to find the, the best quote ever on earmarking, even better than uh, even better than Yuka's writing on earmarking was uh, Winston Churchill. That's the one over there. So I leave it there.
Thanks so much. Yeah, this was this was great. All right, so now we have a yeah, we have we pay for, for coffee here. Uh, thanks once again, Mick. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.